Hello again students, this is part two of the chapter four lecture. As I was saying on the previous slide, um, there are specialized proteins that often span the lipid bilayer of a cell's membrane, and these proteins help to regulate traffic into and out of the cell. So there's many, there are many um, different types of proteins. Some of these are attached to the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix. Some of them are useful for cell signaling. So for example, um, sort of cascading effects, such as hormones um, circulating throughout the body. Enzymatic activity, so if you have an enzyme um, which is a type of protein that needs to, for example, break down a food such as lactose. Um, it's going to be spanning that lipid bilayer and it's going to take the raw product. In my example here, it would be lactose and it's going to break that down into its constituent sugars for digestion. There are transport proteins. So if there's a molecule that's too big to just diffuse into or out of the cell, it will be a helper protein that will conduct those molecules through a channel. There's intercellular joining for structural support from cell to cell. And there's also cell-cell recognition, which is important for our immune system, especially when we are um, recognizing our own cells as um, safe and part of our own body. Membranes of the cell are selectively permeable. This means that they allow some substances to cross more easily than others. And they block passage of some substances altogether. So things that you need for your cells on a day-to-day -day basis, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other small nonpolar molecules, as well as some water molecules, can pass freely through the lipid bilayer. There's going to be um, a variety of other molecules that are too large or they're polar, which means they have a charge to them. Um, certain ions and some water molecules are not going to freely pass through that lipid bilayer. So if they need to enter or exit the cell, they're going to have to use um, a protein in order to be transported across that bilayer. Okay, so the next few slides having to deal with organelles are all specific to the eukaryotic cell. The nucleus is separated from the cytoplasm by the nuclear envelope, which is a double membrane similar to the phospholipid bilayer. There are long DNA molecules and associated proteins that form fibers called chromatin. And one chromatin fiber is a chromosome. When we talk about mitosis and meiosis, you'll become much more familiar with the terms chromosome and chromatin. This is just a depiction of the relationship between a DNA molecule, chromatin, and a chromosome. So here we have that nice double helix of a DNA molecule. It consists of um, that double helix which is composed of the um, sugar phosphate backbone, as well as the nitrogenous bases, and there are associated proteins with that. These form chromatin fibers, and then a coil of these chromatin fibers make up a chromosome. Ribosomes are very important organelles. They are produced in the nucleolus, which is within the nucleus and they are responsible for the synthesis of proteins. So the huge variety of proteins that our cells need to manufacture are all made in ribosomes. And there are two main types of ribosomes. There's 
There are those that are suspended in the cytosol, which is the fluid within the cell, and there are those that are either attached to the nucleus or the endoplasmic reticulum. Genes ultimately control protein production and hence cellular activities. So what we have here is a depiction of inside an individual cell. We have the nucleus here in purple. And remember that all of a cell's DNA, the whole genome for that organism, is contained within the nucleus of every cell in the body. Some of that DNA is not expressed, just depending on what type of cell it is. Uh, for those genes that are expressed, there is going to be synthesis of messenger RNA within the nucleus. Here we have red messenger RNA. It's going to exit the nucleus and it's going to move into the cytoplasm via a pore or an opening in the nuclear envelope. And then there's going to be synthesis of protein in the cytoplasm. So proteins are made from mRNA strands within a ribosome. The endomembrane system is responsible for manufacturing and distributing cellular products. And the cytoplasm is partitioned by organelle membranes. Some of these membrane, membranous organelles are connected to each other, and it includes the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, and vacuoles. The endoplasmic reticulum, sometimes abbreviated ER, produces an enormous variety of molecules. And it's also divided into two categories, smooth ER and rough ER. And rough ER is called rough because it is studded with these ribosomes. So rough ER looks a little bit um, granular in comparison with the smooth ER. Cells that end up secreting a lot of protein have to have a large amount of rough ER. So for example, your salivary glands, they secrete enzymes into your mouth and that is the first step in breaking down food. So your salivary glands, the cells within those salivary glands contain a lot of rough ER, thus they are able to produce many enzymes that produce, um, sorry, that break down food. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not have ribosomes on the surface, and it's responsible for synthesizing lipids such as steroids. Your liver cells and the cells in ovaries and testes have a lot of smooth ER. And an interesting fact here is that when you expose your liver cells to a certain drug, it's going to cause those liver cells to increase their production of smooth endoplasmic reticulum as well as detoxifying enzymes, and that is going to lead to an increased tolerance to that drug. So the longer you take something, um, the more of a chance you have of basically losing any therapeutic effects of the drug. The Golgi apparatus receives, refines, stores, and distributes chemical products of the cell. So it's going to receive vesicles from this the ER, it's going to modify the proteins, and it's going to export those proteins to other parts of the cell. So you can think of it as kind of receiving and shipping. Here's the receiving side of the Golgi apparatus. Notice here, this is a colorized SEM, and a new vesicle is forming over at this end. And if we want an illustrated depiction of this, we have a transport vesicle that is being sent from the rough ER, the receiving side of the Golgi apparatus here, 
um, new transport vesicles from the Golgi apparatus forming here. And then this would be the plasma membrane of that individual cell. Moving on to lysosomes, they are absent in most plant cells. They contain digestive enzymes and they function to destroy harmful bacteria as well as to digest unwanted organelles. So for example, if a cell is dying, if it's reached the end of its lifespan, so to speak, it might be digested by these lysosomes or if you have damage to cells, the parts of the cell can essentially be recycled through breaking those parts down with digestive enzymes and reusing um, those damaged parts. So you can think of a lysosome as being like a little stomach. And again, they're absent in most plant cells. Vacuoles are, are large sacs of membrane that bud off from the ER, Golgi apparatus, or plasma membrane. And they mostly function to store organic nutrients as well as water. In flower petal cells, the central vacuoles may contain pigments that attract pollinators. And those pollinators can actually oftentimes see those pigments um, differently than we do. Generally, those pigments are perceived as being brighter, almost fluorescent, and they help to attract pollinators. Central vacuoles may also contain poisons that deter herbivores. Uh, just a side note here, if you ever wonder what the difference is between poisonous and venomous, in order for something to be poisonous, that means that there are detrimental effects to you when you ingest that item. If it's venomous, it means that if it bites you, then there's going to be different detrimental effects. So it's not biologically correct to say that that is a poisonous snake. It is biologically correct to say that is a venomous snake. Just a fun little side note. Okay, so basically this is an overview of everything I just went over. You can um, study this just to cement the ideas that I covered here. But again, we have the rough ER. It is studded with ribosomes, Golgi apparatus here, the plasma membrane of the cell. Some products can be secreted from that cell. And then we also have vacuoles that store cell products as well as lysosomes that carry digestive enzymes and confuse with other vesicles. Chloroplasts are used for energy conversion and they are only found in organelles of photosynthetic organisms. Um, they gather energy from sunlight and they convert it to sugar and it's unique to plants and algae. We're going to be covering a lot more detail of photosynthesis um, in a later chapter. So you'll learn a little bit more about the specific reactions that occur within the cells in order to convert sunlight into food. Mitochondria are also used for energy conversion. They are nicknamed the powerhouse of the cell and they harvest energy from foods such as sugars in order to produce ATP, which is your cell's universal energy source, stands for adenosine triphosphate. And this process of harvesting energy from sugars and other foods in order to produce ATP is known as cellular respiration, which will also devote a whole chapter to this process later in the semester. The cytoskeleton helps with cell shape and movement. And I'm going to go ahead and pause here and pick up where I leave off in the next segment.